Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, webinar, uh, Warmth 101 Part 6. Uh, I'd like to begin now. Uh, thank you very much for those who are uh, joining in and uh, uh, it's much appreciated and I hope uh, everybody is doing well in this uh, pan pandemic situation. Uh, just to make sure that uh, we product, so he would handle run this uh, smoothly, uh, can you please mute your microphones because I can hear some voices. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, this is the second part of the uh, the same subject: chemicals in te textile industry health and environmental and the performance impact. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in the first part, which we focused on the uh, recycling and the bioplastic uh, biodegradability, um, I will briefly uh, review those uh, in the first section of this uh, webinar. Uh, and also we have the recording to provide if you're interested. So in this uh, webinar, uh, we have four parts. Um, first, the intro part, uh, I'll briefly introduce uh, myself and the HINMEX organization and also virtual assistance program um, in this uh, pandemic situation. And in the second category, uh, I'll review briefly about the recycling and the biodegradability, uh, although we covered this uh, in the last uh, webinar. Uh, many folks uh, contacted me and they wanted to uh, have the recording of the webinar and also they were really interested in the subject itself. So I will briefly um, review this uh, today. And then uh, water repellency and the waterproof and breathability technologies and also after sales treatments and the maintenance uh, section. And if I have the time left, then I will go through briefly about the industry standards, certifications and the collective efforts. Um, we may not have time for Q&A today, but uh, please feel free to uh, send me email or call me. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to address them. So without further ado, let's uh, go through the intro. Now I repeat this uh, in the every, every webinar, uh, because we have new uh, folks who are joining in uh, without uh, uh, any previous uh, webinar attendance uh, in this uh, uh, series. So for those for those of you who are joining in for the second time or third time, uh, please uh, uh, allow uh, me to do this uh, quickly. Um, so HINMEX organization, we have six uh, different product categories and uh, we have been recognized with ISPO Top of Innovation Award in all six product categories, thanks to the breakthrough innovation and uh, um, which uh, expand from the uh, performance improvements and the significant uh, environmental and social contributions. So HINMEX uh, is uh, headquartered in uh, Montreal, Canada, and we have uh, regional offices in China and uh, in Korea. And uh, we make all the products in China and we ship uh, all throughout the world. And uh, uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I'm um, responsible for the HINMEX worldwide organization based in Montreal. And I studied textile engineering uh, with some uh, professional experiences in R&D sales and marketing. Uh, before I established HINMEX Worldwide, I was working for 3M as the representative of uh, Tinsulate, Scotchlight and Scotchgard. And uh, previously I was in Korea working for Honey Synthetic Fiber uh, company. And I'm the creator and inventor of all products and technologies under HINMEX brand. And I created and invented um, uh, the um, uh, proprietary vision in motion technology. And recently I've been recognized as the top 100 fab leaders by Marsum. And uh, this is a great honor for me because our efforts uh, in creating uh, breakthrough technologies which benefit both performance and environment and uh, 
uh, health and environment. Uh, it is a great honor that it's uh, the effort is recognized, especially these days. These types of awards tend to focus more on the uh, environmental social benefits uh, that we create. So it's uh, once again a great honor and I'll be presenting some of the uh, technologies uh, recognized by this uh, award in this uh, webinar as well because it's relevant to the subjects that I'm pre uh, presenting today. And uh, briefly about the HIMAX's COVID-19 virtual assistance program. So uh, with this pandemic uh, going on, uh, we are not able to uh, travel to attend uh, trade shows or have even meetings with suppliers or customers. Uh, and uh, many people in the industry um, have difficulties in getting the up-to-date information and the most cutting edge uh, technologies in this industry, even for the uh, general education or design or specification assistance and things like that. So HeatMax uh, designed this uh, virtual assistant program and uh, this webinar is a, a part of this program and uh, the uh, industries in apparel, footwear glove, home textiles, sleeping bags and food bags, um, they all can benefit and um, the target audience we have any, uh, if you have anything to do with the specifications or even logistics uh, uh, designs um, uh, or general uh, management, uh, you can benefit from this uh, program. And uh, we, we kicked it off on the October 1st and uh, we have been uh, doing uh, this webinar on weekly or bi-weekly uh, up to uh, webinar number five. And uh, it took uh, almost four weeks for this uh, webinar number six because there was a, a Thanksgiving holiday in USA and then there were some other uh, conflicting schedules on our side. And in December also is uh, going to be difficult to do the webinar. So I'm uh, considering whether I should do another one in January or I'll do another one uh, on the third week of uh, of uh, October, uh, December, although it's uh, pretty close to the holiday season, uh, I will um, collect some information from customers and then uh, decide. And then uh, all of you who are registered will get the notifications uh, for any subsequent uh, webinars. And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we kicked it off on the uh, October 1st. And we covered a lot of uh, things, especially uh, the information relating to um, thermal insulation and how it works and pros and cons of different uh, technologies. And uh, uh, I had a special webinar focusing on gloves and footwear because it, it's quite different from the apparel that we normally talk about. And, um, and uh, November 5th, we did the first session of the chemicals in the textile industry. Um, and uh, today is the second session. And uh, like I said uh, to you, uh, all of uh, future uh, uh, webinars, as long as you are uh, uh, registered, you'll get the notification emails as well as it's going to be posted on www.hemex.com. And uh, we also offer a brand or company specific webinars. So what it is, is that um, we are in an open forum. So even if you have questions, uh, about the particular designs or performance uh, that your company targets, or if you are uh, joining in from colleges, then uh, you might have some uh, different needs uh, rather than the um, calling from the um, the uh, uh, companies. So for those of you who might have uh, uh, specific uh, needs, uh, we can organize a separate uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, we can set the time based on the convenient time of each brand, company or college. So uh, this part, I reviewed it. I, I presented it uh, quite extensively uh, in the uh, first part of this uh, subject. Uh, so I'll go through it really quickly. Um, now this map shows uh, the number of countries, which is over 40, which have the laws to ban the importation of recycling plastics into their shores. Now, the, the countries uh, marked in blue uh, or green, it doesn't mean that they are in the opposite position, meaning that they uh, promote the importation 
of the uh, recycling uh, material. Um, it's just that uh, they it's it, the map is showing in blue and green uh, different uh, things that they uh, local uh, uh, or government. Uh, local governments or countries are doing uh, to uh, enhance their uh, environmental uh, positions. Um, now, um, if uh, in general, um, the public in the uh, developed countries um, are led to believe that recycling is good, it's a virtue. A lot of companies are putting out the, their goals, saying that uh, by uh, 2025, for example, uh, we're going to use 100% recycled uh, material and so on and so forth. Now, in my perspective, and uh, it, this has been proven by many countries uh, who don't want recycling material. Why? If it's so virtue, it's a so, if it's so good, why these countries don't want it? Uh, that's because it's bad for these uh, the environment of these countries. Not only these countries, in fact, it's bad for uh, uh, all the countries in the globe. So uh, this is what I reviewed last time. Um, in the recycling process, I pointed out three key areas uh, uh, to show why uh, uh, recycling, the way it's done currently, is not good for the environment. So Hinmax uh, uh, has been able to develop breakthrough technologies, uh, which uh, has been able to uh, reuse the material uh, without creating all these uh, uh, issues that I showed you earlier. It's under uh, the clean recycling initiative that I, um, uh, uh, that the logo marks here, it consists of the clean re recycled material and the cleanly recyclable technologies. So if any of you are interested, um, I'll be more than happy to provide all the details. By the way, uh, most of um, HIMAX customers are adapting this uh, because they find this very uh, innovative and uh, really helpful for the environment without creating a lot of uh, um, bad impacts. So uh, in the Clean Recycling Initiative, uh, there is a lot to it. But in a brief uh, uh, overview, uh, there are two parts. It's uh, two methods. Uh, one is uh, called inline method, and it eliminates all of those issues, uh, the negative environmental impacts created uh, in the normal uh, recycling process. And uh, it is uh, incorporated in three of our product categories, uh, N down, I down, and compact max. And that there is also a post consumption method. And by doing this, uh, we minimize the transportation and carbon footprint issues. And uh, we eliminate uh, these two uh, major areas of the uh, concerns. So um, uh, once again, if you're interested in this, uh, I'll be happy to provide all the details about this. Uh, and uh, this uh, is also a very important subject and it relates a lot with uh, what uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, in the later part of this discussion. It's a microfiber contamination in our water system. This is uh, becoming uh, bigger. Uh, it's becoming more aware um, by many people, including the uh, governments, uh, municipalities and things like that. So I'll uh, briefly explain to, uh, to you this. And once again, because it relates to what I'm going to discuss uh, later on, I want to present some details. So a pollution of freshwater and seawater habitats and uh, an average washing load of six kilogram when you do a home laundry, could release an estimated 137,000, so it's 138,000 fibers from polyester cotton blend fabric and almost 500,000 particles from polyester, 100 polyester batch, and uh, 730,000 particles from acrylic. So this is a humongous amount of uh, microplastic contamination that we create in our home laundry and how that impacts um, uh, our daily living is that microplastics are 
uh, are found in 93% of bottled water all around the world. So if you uh, grab a bottle of water and uh, nine out of 10 uh, bottles uh, uh, contain microplastics and the beer on average has 4.05 man-made particles, mostly plastic fibers per liter. Ingesting microplastics could cause a number of potentially harmful health impacts. By the way, uh, when I quote these uh, uh, information, I always put the, uh, where the um, information came, uh, 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 comes from uh, on the bottom. Sometimes it's a link, sometimes it's a, a, a person's uh, uh, name and uh, identification. So you can always uh, refer back to those, uh, those uh, information. So. When it comes to hidden max, uh, we were aware of this uh, situation and uh, we took a totally different approach. And uh, we decided to not use microfibers, which will break down much easier. So in our vegan down max, loft max and stretch max, uh, products. Uh, we uh, do not use any uh, microfibers and uh, therefore create less of an issue. And uh, uh, um, yet our performance uh, is uh, 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 much uh, better than um, competitive products out there. So uh, we were able to achieve uh, both performance and the environmental benefits. And uh, I also uh, covered this uh, very um, more extensively in the first session of the uh, this subject uh, 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 in in November, uh, a lot of people misunderstand uh, the terms being used in the industry: uh, biodegradable and uh, biodegradability. And I will give you a brief overview of this. Uh, so there are, are compostable plastics that will decompose under a very specific conditions that are met only in industrial composting plants. So these plastics cannot be labeled as biodegradable. However, there are many, um, many uh, companies who are doing this and uh, so this is something that we need to be very aware so if you are going to pay a lot of money to use biodegradable material we have to understand whether it's truly biodegradable or it's uh, compostable plastics so it is defined by both american european standards that compostable plastics cannot be claimed as biodegradable and the bioplastics is an, another uh, example of that. So bio-based PET, for example, uh, is uh, synthesized with bacteria, but this doesn't mean that it will decompose naturally in the environment. So we have to be careful with that. And there are some also degradable plastics. This is not often used in the textile industry because it's uh, it decompose in the air rather than underground. So it would uh, have uh, more tendency to uh, break down and nobody wants that while you use a certain type of product. So um, this is, uh, it's out there. So I wanted to mention that. So uh, it is actually, um, written in uh, the Wikipedia that I put the link uh, down below, credible companies should convey the proper message. And uh, you cannot say a biodegradable when it does not meet the um, national or international standards. So this is uh, really important. There are a lot of fine points in this. And uh, of course, consumers are not going to read all these fine prints. They, if they see bio, they just understand it's, benef it's beneficial for the environment when in fact it may not be. So this is, uh, is a, uh, uh, people in the industry, we have to uh, be aware of these uh, uh, situations and then do the, uh, uh, deliver the right message to the public. And um, uh, some companies will quote specific uh, test methods 
such as ASTM D5511 or ASTM D5526, even in, the, in these test methods, there are a lot of terms that limit uh, companies, commercial companies to use uh, certain terms uh, because it can mislead the public. If you use only the word biodegradable and uh, it, they put out these types of test methods as if uh, it's uh, it's a proof of um, uh, of the uh, properties, but uh, like people say, uh, devils are in details. So uh, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, improper practices in the industry uh, that claim wrong things. So if you are going to use these types of material, we have to make sure that uh, we're doing the right thing. Now, um, oh, sorry, this may not be, oh, sorry, here. So things we have to consider, another thing that we have to uh, consider when it comes to biodegradable thermal insulation. Um, so the conditions that determine uh, the biodegradability, it has uh, chemical compositions in the ground, temperature and gas pressure. There are a lot of different uh, factors that impact. Um, but if you think about it, um, if you have the garbage that goes into the industrial landfill, because there are a lot of factories around that area, then uh, we will have a different uh, uh, chemical compositions or gas uh, pressure and temperatures in the ground rather than having the, the waste from the uh, daily um, living of uh, people. So uh, let's say um, a jacket was uh, a coat containing thermal insulation is, uh, is uh, put underground in the most uh, ideal uh, compostable uh, land site, but thermal insulation, it is, it is packaged between the fabrics, a shell and lining, and there are all kinds of chemical supplies uh, like the dyes, or waterproof, water repellent, the seam sealing, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, many other components like uh, zippers, for example, or other types of plastics um, uh, are in that, uh, in that uh, jacket. So when somebody is promoting thermal insulation, which is sandwiched between all these uh, components, if it's really biodegradable that was tested only on the material itself, this is another big question. And um, Personally, I have not seen in the uh, industry uh, that a company puts out this type of information. So uh, once again, if you are considering um, environmental contributions and if you want to use these types of material, please be aware that there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. So that was um, the quick review of the uh, webinars that uh, the webinar that I did uh, on uh, November uh, 4th or uh, 5th, I think. Um, so this is the newer, uh, this is the new part of the uh, presentation. So I'm going to present uh, some facts about the water repellent treatment. Now, um, I have even seen the water repellent treatment on the baby clothes. And is this, is this the right thing to do? And uh, so I will address those uh, uh, issues uh, in this uh, part of the presentation. Before I explain uh, to you uh, what the water repellent uh, uh, treatment uh, is and what it does uh, for the environment and health, uh, I'd like to define some term, uh, the terms used in the industry uh, because water repellent, or water resistant or waterproof, they are interchangeably used. And if you're not quite familiar with these terms and how it's uh, it's done, you may be confused uh, with the different uh, properties. So I wanted to um, first define what it is. So in water repellent, an example in the natural um, environment, uh, uh, the example here you see is a lotus leaf. Uh, the water basically beads up on the surface. 
um, and uh, when it um, when it is done on the surface of the fabric, it looks like this. Whereas water resistance is an, is an example of water column test. Basically, you give a pressure to the fabric that is uh, placed here, and then you give uh, pressure from water through the column. And then when you see three droplets of water uh, seeping through, that is the um, the the level of waterproof, which is commercially uh, used term. But uh, basically, nothing is waterproof. It's actually water resistant. The wa the level of water resistance in this case is five thousand mm. So um, when I see um, a advertisement uh, from a brand that shows this image uh, for showing the waterproof feature, it's really technically not the right image because the water beating up is water repellency. It's not water resistant or waterproof uh, feature. So um, because there are differences in the way we treat the chemicals to create the water repellent functionality versus water resistant functionality. So with that definition, how the water repellent uh, treatment works is that uh, Water itself has a, a surface tension. It's not shown in this middle section, but all these uh, yellow uh, uh, arrows should be uh, in all of these uh, water uh, molecular molecules. So they hold each other. That's why it creates droplets like this. Water has natural ability to create the mass, which is water. Um, and when it comes to into a contact with a surface material, a certain type of uh, material, that material will provide a surface tension and it will try to pull the water molecule towards it. And uh, so when the um, that surface tension is uh, stronger than the the force that is being placed between the two molecules uh, here, for example, you will see a surface like this. So if you pour water on most surfaces that you have a desk, uh, glass or a kitchen counter, you will see water spreading out like this. And on the fabric surface, it looks like this. Basically, it's a wetting of the surface. Now, if the uh, surface tension between the water molecules is bigger than the surface tension, of the uh, surface area, then we can have this kind of uh, water beating up on the surface. Now, there are many different ways to control the surface tension. And uh, if you use finer fibers and smoother surface, tighter weave, uh, these will help you reduce the surface tension of the fabric, but invariably, um, uh, most uh, fabric uh, structure, whether it's a knit, knitted or a woven, it will not give enough um, enough effect to create these water beads. So surface tension is still high enough not to create these uh, uh, water repellent feature. That's why we do a surface treatment, and we do that with fluorochemic uh, floro, uh, fluoropolymers. So under the family name of PFAS, you have uh, two types of material. It's a PFOA or PFOS. And uh, they are called also C8, C6, C4, and C0, etc. So when you look at the number of uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, carbons here, it's eight here. So in this case, it's C8. In this example, you will see six uh, carbons, so carbon chains. So it's a, a, that in this case, it's a C6. I'm not going to go into the big details about this because I don't want to make make you bored. But I am important because it relates to the performance. So the the more carbon uh, chain that you have, the higher performance is in general, and the durability. When you call 
uh, durable water repellency, then uh, then uh, the uh, it has to be durable, meaning that it has to stick with the uh, uh, the um, the fabric longer. However, um, with different uh, number of carbon chains, it can the durability can change. So the issues of the water repellent treatment, it's harmful for the environment and health. So C8 was first used in the military applications as early as 1940s. So it's uh, 70, 80 years ago. And commercially manufactured since 1950. And uh, it was developed uh, by DuPont in USA. And the first uh, class action lawsuit was filed in in 2001. So almost 50 years uh, later, people realized that uh, that uh, it's making people sh uh, sick. So the class action lawsuit was filed in. And uh, in 2006, uh, USA EPA created C8 stewardship to phase it out. And it's no longer used in manufacturing process in USA. Now I'm using the USA example, but uh, Environment Canada it actually does a great job in, in, um, in being uh, forefront uh, of these types of actions. Uh, we see many examples of that, uh, but I'm using some USA data because there are some more data uh, accumulated from that side. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, we are not uh, seeing this uh, CA material. In fact, the, it is banned in USA, but it's not banned in other countries and a lot of garments or uh, home textiles and all kinds of uh, uh, textile products are made overseas and being imported and we don't have the control over that. So we still have a lot of products that we use on the daily basis. Now, if you look at this uh, data, you will be surprised. Between 2005 and 2006, over 69,000 participants um, had their blood tested and over 97% of participants have C8 present in their blood. Now, one of the biggest issues of C8 or these uh, PFAS uh, uh, chemical compound is because it does not break down. So once it goes into your bo uh, body, it is there. So if you are uh, more than uh, 15 years old, basically uh, since uh, 2005 and 2006, and uh, the likelihood of uh, uh, C8 presence in your body is more than 97%. Basically, that's what it is. And so with this, industry has come up with Gen X chemicals. So what they did was the, they reduced the number of carbon chains, uh, thinking that it is, it breaks down easier, therefore it's more environmentally friendly. However, the ongoing investigations by the EPA says that it may not be the case. Now it is still ongoing. It takes years and years to uh, for us to really understand the true impact uh, in health and environment for any types of chemicals. So still it is ongoing, but, uh, uh, but uh, when um, companies put out uh, these terms like uh, Gen X chemicals, it can mislead people. It can mislead people to think that, oh, it's, uh, it's an improvement and it's, it's now safe to use when in fact it may not be the case. I'll give you another example of this type of marketing uh, later on because there is a chemical called uh, green earth. And um, once again, the, uh, the, the uh, investigation is ongoing, but when people see this term green earth, oh, it must be good for the environment when in, it, in fact it's not, uh, it may not be. So there are a lot of marketing terms being created by many, many com uh, companies that uh, may not give us the truth or true picture about uh, the use of those chemicals. So um, I have uh, actually recently found a really interesting article 
about um, about PFAS. In fact, it was uh, reported in The Guardian not long ago. I think it was uh, only last week. And uh, what they found, uh, it's uh, a um, Harvard uh, University researcher who uh, who found that uh, uh, the PFAS in our body uh, may reduce the uh, immun uh, the immunization effectiveness of uh, the vaccines uh, for COVID COVID nineteen. So um, there have been a lot of uh, information about this, um, the harmful impacts of these types of chemicals. Now, with this, um, is it right to use uh, these types of material? And uh, and especially if you think about the fact that. Although we call it durable water repellent, they're not so durable. It, it, it uh, will disappear after uh, repeated washes. And in fact, uh, a, a good majority of these uh, DWR treatments, it goes away in big part by only three to five washes. So with this um, short duration of the performance, is it worth for us to risk our health and environment and especially when I see this type of treatment even in the baby wear it concerns me by a great deal and um, I want to address uh, examples like this uh, I have many in fact uh, even in this uh, uh, webinar already in the last uh, 30 minutes I already uh, gave you some examples of this but recycling, biodegradable, water repellent, waterproof, uh, a lot of it is driven by the industry to try to prove the, uh, the certain type of performance features uh, for the public. And uh, as a result, the public blind, blindsightly think that recycling is good when in fact there are a lot of harmful impact uh, from the recycling. And there are many other examples like this. So I think, uh, <coughs> sorry, us in the industry, we have a really important role to play. And this is one of the key, key reasons why I'm presenting uh, um, these types of uh, information. In the meantime, uh, Max has developed breakthrough technologies in um, water repellent uh, features without uh, using PFAS um, uh, product. Uh, so this is an example of competitive product on the left and the Hinmax on the right. And you will see that the Hinmax, uh, it beats up. And uh, this is because of the uh, uh, surface technology that we developed without using PFAS. And waterproof. And um, they, I put it in the quotation marks because it's, it's really water resistant and not waterproof. And the breathable technology that a lot of people use in the industry. Now, why, how does it work? So in the regular fabric uh, structure, there's always gaps created between the warp and weft yarns and the directionality and the cross point, it creates gaps. So even if uh, you have the most dense fabrics, uh, it doesn't block the water completely. So industry has been using two options. One option one is more, uh, it's a less expensive option. It's a, it's a vinyl type uh, family type of uh, chemical or PU being a little bit more expensive, but these are not breathable. And the option two, is a floral uh, polymers like EPTFE, it's expanded poly tetra uh, fluoroethylene. And it has a lot of holes in the middle here. So it allows um, the uh, water to not seep through, yet the moisture to escape from the body. So, sorry, uh, let me get rid of this. Um, 
So this is an, it, it's an example of how waterproofing is tested. I showed, showed it to you earlier. So when it comes to the industry metrics that uh, is often used, uh, let's say 10,000 mm. And what does 10,000 mm mean? So let's say you are uh, laying down on the floor and uh, you put your water column on your chest and uh, you stack up, you pour water up to 10 meters or basically two story commercial building height and that's the, the uh, pressure that you get. So that is 10,000 mm. Now, if you look at the information in the uh, website, um, or the uh, some company literature, things like these are claimed. So this example, medium 10,000 to 15,000 mm, it says medium protection for activities like hiking, skiing in moderate rain, snow and wind. Less than 10,000 mm, minimal protection for activities like running and hiking in intermittent light rain and snow. In the meantime, if you look at other types of information, by the way, on the bottom here, I indicated where the information came from. Heavy rain in gale force wind is about the equivalent to 4,000 mm. A full-sized man with a backpack on, kneeling on one knee, that knee area receives about 12,000 mm water column uh, pressure. So there's a lot of mismatching information out there so let's think about like whichever uh, figure that you use let's think about the real life situations how often do you walk in gale force wind or heavy rain if it rains a lot like this here on the left hand side you would shelter yourself you are not going to have extended walk and uh, climbing water hurricanes, uh, you know, only there may be a small fraction, uh, a fraction of the population who might uh, subject themselves in this type of situation for whatever reasons they might be. Con but majority, the most part of the population do, do not have to do that. But why, why do we need 10,000 mm or even 5,000 mm uh, for the garments that we use? And why do we build specs or use chemicals for extreme conditions for general purpose wear? So, for example, I'm over 50 years old. In my younger days, I used to camp with my friends. And um, even the worst weather situations, I, you know, looking back in those days, I never had to uh, subject myself in these types of situations. Of course, you deal with all kinds of different weathers, but not the, like a week have uh, we always find the the ways to to shelter ourselves and uh, and uh, since my younger days uh, i have never had to deal with these types of situations i'm korean and in korea uh, gore-tex has been extremely popular and uh, I, I generally don't mention any brand names in my presentations but this is a reality, so I, I, I think it's important that uh, we actually get the proper picture. So uh, the, the middle aged ladies in their 50s and 60s, when they go to uh, markets to do grocery shopping, they go out with uh, uh, Gore-Tex uh, jackets or pants and um, they never hike, they never camp and they never do any of these activities. but because of the promotions, uh, because of the marketing that the uh, industry has done, it became a norm for people to use these types of uh, uh, garments. Now, if it doesn't have any other impact other than just having those uh, properties, then it may not be a big deal, but these chemicals, when it's used, so the fabric and these chemicals are combined, uh, bonded together, and we cannot separate the two components, so it's not recyclable. So there has been a big debate about the environmental impact of these types of chemicals. And the argument that was brought forward by some companies is that it's more durable, therefore it lasts longer. Now, I put a big question mark down there because that is really um, debatable. 
and uh, we would have to investigate uh, the basis of of this. But in um, my personal experiences, uh, the garments with this type of treatment and without these types of treatment, I personally have not found difference in terms of the longevity. I don't know what your experiences are. In fact, if uh, the treatment is not done properly, these uh, base chemicals here down here, it can crack and it can reduce the longevity of the, um, the, the garments uh, that we wear. Now, in addition to the environmental impact, I would like to also address something really important. While we focus on the climate, so what's happening outside, we are ignoring the micro uh, climate uh, environment. So, um, like I mentioned, in my lifetime, I never had to uh, deal with a huge uh, rainfall and uh, having to stay outside uh, under the rainfall for extended period of time. However, uh, I sweat every second, it, it continuously sweat, and uh, it, the sweating is a portion of our body functionality that keeps your body temperature uh, constantly. So how you deal with the sweat is really, really, really important. Uh, now, I'm sure that uh, many of you have uh, either heard or experienced that, uh, that uh, you wear a waterproof and breathable jacket and you do a hiking for uh, 10 minutes or even the, uh, the taking a walk in a fast speed uh, for 10 minutes and you get soaked in, inside with uh, uh, sweat. Now that's because your, your um, uh, sweat is not able to escape from your body and it may be uh, because of the uh, treatment under the fabric. So. Once again, industry has been focusing on the, the, on the climate when in fact uh, microclimate is a lot more important for us to manage properly, in my opinion. And the uh, industry has addressed with this with uh, MVTR uh, or in, in the term of uh, breathability. Um, However, we have to also understand how the test is done. So is it done under natural evaporation uh, for 24 hours? In a lot of cases, they uh, leave the water in a certain condition for 24 hours. It, it measures how much uh, water escapes. However, our body doesn't work like that. When you uh, have a higher uh, level of activities, your body will produce pressurized moisture from your body and you have a lot more uh, moisture that is coming out of your body. So this is a really important factor. This is why although there are uh, uh, waterproof and breathable fabrics that have really high number in terms of MVTR or breathability, however, uh, a lot of people say that uh, they uh, uh, in high level of active, even moderate level of activities, um, the, they get soaked in, in, in their water. So sweat rate, I just indicated it to give you an idea. Uh, it uh, produces one liter per hour in fast walking. It's a brisk walking um, and it may vary quite a lot depending on your body metabolism um, and what you wear and things like that. So this is a very important in, in thermal uh, uh, insulation perspective. This is also really, really important for us to properly uh, design our products because as the humidity increases, thermal conductivity also increases, meaning that you can lose your heat very, very quickly if you have a little bit of uh, uh, moisture close to your body. And in the meantime, uh, Hinmax has the technology that addresses this without using any chemicals like you saw earlier. So in this uh, example here, sorry, we put the uh, our Himex material and uh, we pour the water onto this. Now this fish, uh, please don't uh, take it as a as a as animal testing because we know that there's no harmful chemical in this. So basically, without 
any chemical being used, it withstand the, uh, the water column test. Uh, uh, and uh, so we give a sustainable water resistance uh, uh, performance and also breathability side of it. If you uh, look at this demo, basically we put two cups of water, hot water, and then after a few minutes, we um, uncover the um, the fabrics and this is uh, on the left hand side sorry um, so left hand side this is uh, a top quality waterproof breathable fabric and you will see a lot of uh, moisture condensation in this area whereas our Himmax, there is no trace of moisture condensation at all so this is a, a an example of the uh, eco-friendly performance features that we were able to develop and incorporate in our Hinmax uh, product technologies. And uh, we only have uh, 10 minutes left. I'll go really quick with this after sales treatments and uh, maintenance. So dry cleaning, this is something very important that I need to address here too. Dry cleaning chemicals. So we actually label our garments, sleeping bags, whatnot, uh, with uh, dry cleaning instructions especially when we use uh, down feather material or uh, electroplated uh, zippers or logos uh, uh, in our garments. However, the dry cleaning is really toxic for the environment and health. And the PERC perk, which has been proven to inflict a lot of health issues, including eye irritation, memory loss, and liver and kidney damage, and even cancer. So impacts on our ecosystem is great on this uh, um, uh, quite large in this uh, uh, dry cleaning not only the um, the cost is is high to do dry cleaning rather than home wash but the impact in the ecosystem and health is 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 quite large now recently um, it i cannot say it's recent uh, but uh, in the last decade or so uh, there has been a brand uh, named the green earth uh, it's a dry cleaning uh, solvent called the uh, Green Earth was in, introduced, and it's a D5. It's um, you can look up uh, the information on website about D5. Um, when you look at the term Green Earth, uh, it once again conveys the message that it's good for the environment. And uh, but uh, in 2013. Um, it's uh, you can see the uh, link here, but Environment Canada issued a, 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 a report that says uh, long term harmful effect in the environment and uh, its biological uh, diversity. And there has been a debate because there were reports that concluded otherwise. And D5 is actually quite widely used. So deodorant and uh, shampoo and things like that contains a certain quantity of D5 as well. But uh, the conclusion on the impact and uh, environmental impact and health, uh, it's still ongoing. The investigation is ongoing and the conclusion has not been fully made in my uh, understanding. So um, when we look at uh, what I wanted to show you here is uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the terms that industry use is not controlled. Anybody can say anything, but uh, um, the the real impact and the the, uh, the long term impact is something that takes years and years for us to understand. So this is uh, really uh, uh, important for us to understand. And when it comes to water repellent treatment um, post uh, production, you have those uh, uh, cans uh, that you can buy uh, either in um, in um, uh, stores or uh, Amazon and things like that. And uh, um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, C8 is uh, banned for production in US and Canada. But if these are made uh, from overseas and bring them in, you don't have uh, control over that. And uh, so what does it uh, um, consist of and any other harmful chemicals? Uh, just so you know, um, uh, President-elect Biden um, 
uh, Biden, uh, one of their uh, um, uh, campaigns was to uh, ban all PAFAS uh, material uh, and uh, classify that as a uh, harmful uh, material. Now, harmful substance. Well, if that happens, the importation of these types of uh, chemicals will not be done, but today it's not the case. So these are the things that we have to uh, be really um, uh, careful. Now, HIMEX provides patent pending eye down and end down technologies that you don't have to do a home, uh, uh, dry cleaning even for the, um, the, 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 uh, the products, uh, consumer products with the uh, down feather. One of the biggest issues of down feather in doing home laundry is because it takes so long to dry it and it takes hours and hours to, 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 to do the laundry. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, people have a tendency to do the laundry in these uh, types of garments. But uh, our breakthrough technology uh, helps you reduce the drying time of uh, downfield uh, products by 60 to 70 percent, which is a huge, huge reduction. And it is categorized, it is uh, recognized as the largest energy saving technology in the global uh, textile industry. And we provide all these additional benefits that uh, benefit the environment. And uh, I just provide a link here where you can see um, uh, the performance features of eye down and end down and it's a uh, it's our heat in the heat max uh, youtube channel so when you have a chance please go and check it out and uh, this is an example that i presented to one of my customers in the footwear industry uh, the competitive brand versus heat max when you look at the old vehicles you have a really large fuel tank and uh, it but it because of the fuel efficiency being so low it doesn't uh, give you much mileage, but the new vehicles with the cutting edge technologies, it gives you all kinds of uh, uh, benefits as you see in this uh, marketing literature. Even with a small fuel tank, you can go much farther. So I, I use this analogy to compare competitive brands versus Himex technologies. So when it comes to temperature rating, um, in the footwear industry, um, the labels of competitive brand is used uh, to, to indicate quality with the uh, gram weight of uh, insulation material. But this is a really old uh, way of thinking because uh, Hinmax was able to match temperature rating of competitive brands 200 GSM with our 100 GSM material. Same goes with the 400 GSM versus 200 GSM. So it's like uh, fuel efficient cars. We are much more efficient in using uh, the technologies to give the same level of performance. Not only that, we give so many additional performance feature, features um, for the footwear. So apparel, it's the same situation. So we provide all these additional uh, innovations uh, to benefit the performance. And these are the performance features that really benefit for the environment. And uh, in this section, all these uh, uh, performance features are either socially or environmentally uh, beneficial. Uh, this is the reason why uh, HIMAX has been recognized with the top of innovation award, as well as the uh, uh, top 100 leader category of the, um, the, the award. Now, uh, industry, industry standards, certifications, and collective efforts. This is an important uh, subject to cover, but the time is almost up and uh, so I think I need to wrap it up, uh, but so you know, you have, uh, we have the recording of the webinar number one, and I covered this uh, this subject uh, in the, uh, in that uh, first part of this subject. So uh, if you're interested in this subject, uh, please let me know, I'll send you the webinar uh, recording. Um, lastly, uh, please go and have a look at the hemex.com because we, uh, we built this uh, website uh, because of the co uh, COVID-19. Uh, we're doing everything virtually these days. So you will see application specific contents. So if you're interested in only the uh, lightweight apparel, you should not have to deal with all kinds of information with other 
types of applications. We have all the relative information in one section for each application type, whether it's a, a footwear glove, home textile, sleeping bag, a medium or heavy um, apparel. And uh, it, it, it provides a lot of uh, 3D model based video content so that it is easier for you to understand. Um, uh, real lastly, I will communicate with you uh, what I will do for the subsequent um, webinar. But uh, if you are interested in any of these um, uh, webinar contents uh, from the uh, webinar number one to webinar number uh, five, uh, please let me know. I will provide you with the um, with the uh, recording. Um, with that, I will end uh, this uh, uh, webinar and uh, you can contact me, by the way, through this email address or my phone number is down here. And uh, please feel free to contact me even for a little uh, a chat, uh, even if you don't have a specific question. Um, so that's it. Once again, thank you very much for your time and um, I look forward to having you again in the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much everyone.